Hello, this is Hipster Sloth, and I'm here to talk to you today about getting DualShock 4 tracking in PS Move service. I don't normally talk in these videos, but there's enough material to go over here and a lot of uh, complicated concepts. I felt that it made the most sense for me to just uh, explain the subject matter. Um, so I think the first thing I should talk about is why bother with the DualShock 4 at all. Uh, we already have the PS Move controller tracking, um, and the DualShock 4 um, seems to be like a inferior controller as far as tracking is concerned. It's got certainly much more buttons and whatnot, but um, you know why spend the time trying to make that work? So for me, there's two reasons to bother with it. The first is that it's a really common controller. Even if you don't have a PS Move, chances are you probably have a DualShock 4, I mean, particularly if you have a PS4. Um, so if you're interested in trying out track motion controllers and have a VR headset, um, it's a very accessible way to get into it. The second reason is that the PS Move controller does not have a thumbstick on it. And if you're trying to develop a VR title that needs a thumbstick and a track motion controller, the DualShock 4 is a nice compromise. Uh, could use the PS Navi controller, but that's not officially supported anymore. And it seems like Sony is leaning in the direction of having people support the DualShock 4 preferably. So um, it seemed like this would be a handy tool to allow people to develop track control games when they need a thumbstick. Um, if you wanted to iterate quickly on your PC, um, or you couldn't afford a PSVR dev kit, um, or you could afford one, but only one of them, and you want to make sure when your team has them, this seemed like a nice compromise. So that's why we're bothering with this in the first place. The PS Move service already has the ability to track the PS Move controller. The tracking is accomplished by taking optical data from the PS3i camera and combining that with sensor data from the PS Move's IMU. The DualShock 4 can be tracked using the same general system that we have in place for tracking uh, the PS Move controller but there's some hardware differences that affect the specifics. The most obvious difference is the shape of the tracking light. On the PS Move, you have a sphere. On DualShock 4, you have a little triangular shaped light bar. The problem with the light bar is that it's a lot easier to occlude when you hold the controller. By occlude, I mean turning it such that the camera can't see the light shape anymore. On the PS Move, it's still possible to occlude it, but it's a lot harder because you have that spherical shape, your hand's usually behind it. On the sensor side, the PS Move controller and its IMU Inertial measurement unit, if you're not familiar with that acronym, has an accelerometer, a gyroscope, and a magnetometer. The accelerometer gives you the direction of gravity, the gyroscope tells you how the controller is turning, and the magnetometer is just a compass that says where north is. Uh, the three of those allow you to determine orientation. Uh, the magnetometer in particular allows you to fight yaw drift. If you just have an accelerometer and a gyroscope, you can get orientation, but your controller will slowly drift um, to the left or to the right due to errors that accumulate in the gyroscope. In contrast, the DualShock 4 um, does not have a magnetometer on it. It does have an accelerometer and a gyroscope, which are actually both better than the accelerometer and gyroscope that are in the PS Move controller. But without the magnetometer, you need a way to fight drift. Now, because the tracking shape of the DualShock 4 um, has this nice planar geometry that's not symmetrical, it's actually possible to get an orientation of the controller optically. And you can use this if you have good view of the sensor bar say this is where the controller is facing forward at this point and if you have drift in the orientation I um, mean your uh, added up sensor information you can compensate for it so you need to be able to kind of hand off and blend between the two we'll go into that more in a bit so the first challenge that I faced in trying to get this to work at all was just getting data from the controller uh, fortunately the uh, interface for communicating with it is relatively similar to how uh, we communicated with the PS Move controller and there are other open source libraries and projects out there that have um, communicated with the, D, uh, the DS4. Uh, DS4 Windows is one popular one that was really helpful um, as a reference. Um, so once you get that, um, the problem is that the sensor data appears to come in as um, these raw, uncalibrated bytes. since you have to figure out how to take that and get an actual useful measurement from it. For the accelerometer, you want it in Gs of acceleration. And for the gyroscope, you want it in degrees or radians per second. Um, so how do you go from this raw byte measurement to that? On the PS Move, similar problem. Um, they provide, as one of the queries you can make from the controller, a packet that gives the calibration data. It says, this is kind of the min and the max of these sensors and scales and bias values that allow you to convert that into a reasonable floating point number that gives you Gs or gives you degrees or radians per second. Um, after doing some searching, I couldn't find that same um, calibration packet for the DualShock but if doing a little more research online, it sounded like the data that you got back from the controller already had that calibration data pre-applied. And they said all you had to do was divide the raw byte value you got for the accelerometer uh, by some arbitrary constant, 
for the accelerometer, in which case it said it was 8K, and for the um, gyroscope, um, by another arbitrary number, I believe they said 4K. Um, I was a little skeptical of that because I said, well, maybe they just guessed and maybe it happens to feel right. So I'm going to make some tools to calibrate this. The first calibration tool that I was going to make was going to be the one for the accelerometer. Um, and I was going to try to take the same approach that I took on the magnetometer calibration, where you turn the controller around, that forces the accelerometer to sweep through a range of readings, and that should trace out um, some reasonable shape, and then you make a best fit volume around that shape, and that gives you the center point of the readings, and it gives you the extents of the readings. Um, for the magnetometer, this should be an ellipsoid. It's actually really close to a sphere, but um, if you have any kind of distortions, it'll get distorted into an ellipsoid slightly. The problem with the accelerometer is that um, it's a combination of orientation where gravity is pointing and any linear acceleration you're doing. Um, so if you're holding the controller, it's going to be really hard to hold it totally still. Um, and so I thought, all right, well, maybe what I should do is have the user as part of the calibration tool lay the controller in one of six different poses. You could think of them almost as like a controller yoga pose or something. And hold it still and that pose, have it sample the accelerometer, and at that point, because it's stable on a surface, you should only be getting the measurement of gravity. And then once you have those six average data points, we should be able to construct a best fit volume around that, a best fit ellipsoid. So I implemented this tool, but the problem is I ran into the same issue I had with uh, one version of the magnetometer calibration. There's a couple different ways you can go about trying to compute a best fit ellipsoid given a set of data points. Um, and the one I implemented initially was a um, minimum volume ellipsoid fit, where it tries to shrink the volume as much as possible to fit the data points, even if that means that some of your data points uh, will lie outside of the ellipsoid you compute. Um, and it turns out that um, I ended up with kind of a distorted ellipsoid shape for the small number of points that I got. Um, so um, as a result, the center of the readings, which should have been really close to zero, ended up being kind of off. And so when I would take that computed accelerometer value I'd get from that shape, um, the accelerometer readings were skewed. So that approach wasn't going to work. So then I thought, all right, well, maybe I should bite the bullet and implement a different kind of ellipsoid fit. And the one I probably should have done was the least squared ellipsoid fit. Um, but after spending some time staring at the paper for it, I said, you know, maybe I should just try the simple thing of uh, the thing that I was afraid of doing in the first place of just holding the controller very still in my hand and slowly rotating it around to sweep out a volume and do the same thing with you for the magnetometer uh, sampling where if you have enough samples and you just do a regular bounding box fit, simple as possible fit you can do, you should be able to get the extents and hopefully it's reasonably close to a sphere. So I did that. And it turns out that it, in fact, was incredibly close to a sphere. And it, the scaling value that I got for it ended up being 8K, which is hilarious. I should have just trusted the value in the first place, and I did all of that work just to get that divisor and should have trusted the post online. But it's cool to know that that was the right value.